Finn de Bosch Research and Saarland University, right? Yeah, Saarland University. And Oliver is going to talk about uh, using MEMS gyroscopes for physically unclonable functions. Okay, so good morning from my side to everyone. And I'm going to discuss our paper with you. And as you already said, uh, this is joint work with uh, Christopher Hood, Jorge Guayado, and my professor uh, Helmut Seidel. Well, this is the outline of my talk. I start with a short introduction into PUFFs and give you a short motivation. And then I discuss the variation of the, uh, the reasons for the variation of the MEMS parameters. And I explain the parameters that we use for the key derivation. And uh, then I explain the experimental setup. And then I uh, describe the procedure that we use for quantize our analog measurement values properly into binary strings. And yeah, then the evaluation section includes hemming distances, entropy estimation, and key alignment. And then comes our design proposal for a dedicated MEMS path. And I conclude my talk with a short summary and an outlook. Yeah, so the paths were introduced in 2002 by Papu. And the basic idea is to use uh, or to derive a fingerprint from a complex physical system. And for that, we use the physical properties and we are exploiting the manufacturing variations of the system. And to making use of the path, you have to give a stimulate or you have to stimulate the path by a challenge and then you get a response and from that you can derive a fingerprint or a cryptographic key. And so basic properties for the path is that it has to be unclonable, of course it has to be unique and also the behavior uh, has to be unpredictable. And from a security perspective, uh, there are several um, advantages. For example, the key storage is based on the inherent properties that are hard to clone or hard to read out. And the key is only available on runtime. Yeah, so this gives, this gives you just a few examples about proposed uh, path types from the past years. Um, for example, the delay paths that use uh, variations in delay values of identical semiconductor paths or coding paths uh, that use the capacitances of coding with random dielectric particles, or SRAM paths uh, that use variations in startup values of SRAM, and the MEMS path, so that is, this work is focused on, and we use variations in MEMS physical characteristics. So let me note that a, variation, uh, that a comparison between the different path types uh, is kind of, uh, sometimes a little bit difficult because they are aiming at different proposals a little bit, especially with regard to the uh, number of different challenge response pairs. So let me state that we, uh, similar to, uh, to the SRAM path, for example, that we are just uh, has the objective to, to give uh, one or a few uh, keys and uh, yeah, make a secure key storage here. Yeah, so uh, regarding the IoT, we have to face a lot of uh, security and privacy uh, challenges. So we expect that we get a, a huge number of distributed devices with different architectures, complexity, and also vulnerability. But we, we have to handle personal, so privacy related, but also safety relevant data. And hence, there's the need to provide security and privacy solutions also for the sensor for the sensors that work end-to-end -end from sensor to data storage and processing. Yeah, so I mean, at the end, in crypto, uh, or crypto is based always on the assumption that the, the secret key is really kept secret. And um, yeah, sometimes, especially with regard to such a huge number of distributed devices, this might be kind of an optimistic assumption. And so we, of course, we know different kinds of attacks, uh, like mathematical or protocol attacks, where crypto um, provides uh, good protection in principle, but there are also physical attacks like microprobing, focused iron beam, and so on. And such attacks are much harder to protect. Yeah, and the idea here is now, or in principle, the idea of path is not to store the key in digital form in a device, but to generate the key only when needed by extracting it from the physical source and to delete the key afterwards again. And uh, so, um, the, this idea or the idea of using PATH for this proposal is not a new one actually, uh, but nevertheless it's still very relevant and perhaps more with regard to the IoT than 10 years ago. Yeah, as the title already says, uh, we are investigating microelectromechanical systems 
uh, that are systems with mechanical structures in the micrometer range and uh, electronic structure combined on a substrate or a chip. Uh, typically, this is covered uh, by a mold package that was removed here by an etching process. And yeah, such uh, sensors are distributed or, or inherent in a huge number of, of applications as smartphones in cars and so on. Well, now I come to the uh, manufacturing process. Um, of course, this can give just a short outline of, of the very complex process of manufacturing uh, of the MEM sensors. And, but I give you uh, ma three major steps and I explain the manufacturing variations that are inherent in these processes. So first step is uh, the deposition of the oxide and the epi uh, epitaxial polysilicon layer. And here you uh, have a variation of the layer thicknesses. A second major step is the etching process of the structures and on the one hand you get here a variation of the beam widths uh, or of the structure widths and this has influence for example of the, uh, uh, this influences for example the stiffness of the springs. And on the other hand you get uh, also sidewall inclinations here for the beams and those angles uh, are also different for the two sidewalls uh, of a beam and this is kind of asymmetry in the system. And a, a third major step close to the end of the process is the wafer bonding step. So here a second wafer is bonded to the uh, wafer with our main structure. And for gyroscopes this is typically done in the vacuum at a few millibar. And the uh, process pressure is variating again. And so you get different cavity pressures on different sensors. There are also other uh, dependencies like later outgassing uh, processes uh, dependent on the quality of the connection here for example and so on. Yeah, so here are the parameters that we used for deriving the keys. The first of the parameters were the frequency modes and MEMS gyroscopes has a, a large number of such frequency modes because they are very complex spring mass systems. And the position of those modes uh, is variating um, based on the, the discussed manufacturing variations, especially dependent on the, on the on a variation of the stiffness of the springs, for example. Uh, so the second parameters that we use were the quadrature signals. You can see it here in this picture. So this is in principle an error signal and it occurs if the, um, if the direction of the oscillating mass deviates from its ideal direction. So then you get an error signal here in this direction. And this is, uh, the signal is based on different kinds of asymmetries in the structure. And the third parameters that we used were the capacitances between uh, all the different electrode pairs um, that are necessary to um, measure and drive the sensor structure. So uh, the device under investigation uh, was an experimental design of a three general gyroscope, uh, but it was manufactured in standard MEMS production process. And we measured uh, the sensors on wafer level. As you can see here, you can see the silicon wafer. So that means that we had directly access to the electrodes uh, for measuring and driving the structure and there was no ASIC or no package inside our investigations. And we made our measurements at room temperature also multiple times to determine the noise level or the repeatability of our measurements and at 85 degree to consider temperature influence as well. And we used 85 degree because that's the current upper limit for consumer applications. Uh, and we measured then nine frequency modes, two quadrature signals and six uh, electrical capacitances. And the main components of our equipment or of our setup were an impedance analyzer and this, the probe station where we could uh, have a look inside here that allows to measure the sensors on wafer level, highly automated. So here is just a short overview about the different parts that we need to derive uh, the key from the MEMS. So I already talked about the left side here. So we get from the MEMS then the responses that are in principle our measurement values and that are analog. And the next step is to quantize those analog values um, properly into uh, binary strings. And then we get a kind of a noisy fingerprint or uh, in principle it's a bit string. So here's the procedure that we used for this quantization step. Um, 
Um, the first point is that we assume that our um, parameters are normally distributed, so that's also proved by our measurements, and it's not surprising because uh, it's typical for physical values that are variating based on uh, random manufacturing variations. And then we uh, determine the global distribution based of, our, uh, of the measurement of our 70 sensors, so for each parameter, so that's just an example for one parameter. And then we divide uh, this global distribution into several ranges and a bit combination is then assigned to each range. Uh, important point is that uh, each of these ranges has to be the, an equal probability of occurrence that we get uniformity. And as you easily can see, two things are important here for uh, the number of bits that can be derived from a parameter. Uh, the first point is the width of the global distribution. And the second point is the stability or the robustness of a parameter because this uh, determines how narrow those two inner ranges can be made. And so this is also kind of a trade-off because of course we would like to make them as narrow as possible uh, to get more ranges, um, but there's also then an increasing probability of errors, of course. So at the end, those two um, values determines how many bits can be derived from our parameter. So first, uh, so in the evaluation, we uh, make first a uh, calculation of the hemming distances as, as it is usual in, in the path area. Uh, we um, calculated the interdistances, that is the distance between the keys from different sensors. And it's a measure for the key uniqueness. It's the, it's the blue uh, distribution here. And we also um, determine the intra distances, so that's the distance between the keys generated from the same sensor uh, at different times or at different environmental conditions, at temperature in our case. And so an, an important point is that those two uh, distributions uh, has to uh, overlap just with negligible probability, which is the case here. And then we get a length uh, for the bit string or for the noisy fingerprint here of 63 bits for a correlation upper limit of 0.86. So I will uh, I come back to this correlation issue on the next slide. Uh, just let me say a last point here to this slide. Um, we may also uh, Monte Carlo simulation for the intra distance to get a, a better statistic here and to be able to simulate the worst case. So that means we describe the parameter variation on one sensor uh, by this equation here, um, where this is the, the, the noise floor that we determine for each parameter by our repeated measurements, um, which is normally distributed. Um, this is then a normally distributed random number matrix that is the uh, actual measurement value of a parameter and that is a, um, a temperature shift factor that we determine by our measurements at 85 degree. And so we could make uh, 10,000 runs to get more statistics here for the intra distance because we, we wanted to make a poison fit here uh, to be able to um, calculate uh, the um, probability for a particular maximum number of bit flips, which is an important information for uh, a later calculation. Yeah, so now I come back to the correlation issue. Here you can see the distribution of all of our correlation coefficients. And as you can see, more of the parameters are more correlated uh, and others less. So the problem is, of course, that correlation reduce entropy. And this forces us to, um, um, to, make, uh, to choose a, a value for a correlation upper limit that we accept. And parameters that are stronger correlated than that uh, were rejected. And in turn, this influences, of course, the number of parameters that we can use and also the, the um, length of the noisy fingerprint or the bit string, as you can see here in this table. So before I come to the entropy estimation, um, I have to explain a second Monte Carlo simulation. So to be able to make a meaningful entropy estimation and to make sure that the results of this entropy estimation are not, not affected by the limited length of our uh, bit strings, uh, we wanted to be able to simulate an arbitrary number of, of bits. So for our measured data, we get in total, roughly 4,000 bits for a correlation upper limit of 0.86, for example. And that this might be too less for a meaningful entropy estimation. So we make a second Monte Carlo simulation considering the measure distribution of uh, each parameter and in particular the correlation between the parameters. And we did this uh, first by generating a normally distributed random number matrix 
Then we make a, a Koleski decomposition of the correlation matrix of the, uh, based on the measurements, of course. And this Koleski decomposition allows us to insert the measured correlation into, into this uh, random number matrix. And what is still missing are then the mean values and the standard deviation of our uh, measured parameters. And then we can uh, simulate the sensor responses, uh, as I said, regarding the distribution of the parameters and the correlations. And at first you can see here um, the, the intra distance, now also for the, for the, um, the simulated data, and it shows a similar shape as for the measured data. So now I come to the entropy estimation. Um, we made this first uh, state of the art with a CTEW compression, first with our measured data, and the results were that our measured data shows an incompressibility. But as I said, probably that's affected by the limited length of our uh, uh, bit strings. And so you can see here in this plot now the CTEW compression rate for uh, the different upper correlation limits. Um, for the simulated data. And we see up to 0.92, a correlation upper limit of 0.92, we have almost uh, full entropy um, based on the CTW compression. And actually, that was not the result that we had expected. And so we decided to use additional, additionally available uh, NIST tests. Uh, first, we made the, the NIST test SP822 which just indicates if our data set is truly random or not. And as expected, uh, our simulated data is not truly random. Um, but we can also make use of the min entropy estimations 890B, and the results are here uh, in this plot now. Uh, we made this five, uh, so this includes this five entropy estimation tests, and the most conservative estimations come from the Markov test, as you can see here. And for example, for a, polo, uh, for a correlation upper limit of 0.86, it indicates a min entropy of 4.6 bits per byte or 0.57 per bit. So uh, then we wanted uh, to calculate how many responses would we need to derive a full entropy 128-bit key. And for this calculation, uh, we had a look into um, related work and we used Secure sketches with a syndrome construction for the error correction step, as in Herrewege et al. 2012, and a strong randomness extractor, as used by ISO et al., for example, in 2015. And the result was that we would need 23 responses here to get uh, a full entropy 120 bit uh, key, um, considering, but considering uh, the, the min entropy rate, so the most conservative min entropy rate and an overall decoding failure of less than one in a million. So now, of course, the question is where should 23 responses come from? Um, but there are several measures that can be made to improve uh, or to reduce this number by a lengthening of, of the bit string. So the first point is that we can improve the measurement technique. Because on wafer level, um, we have uh, cable length in the range of a few meters. And our method worked in the baseband, so that means we had a very low signal-to-noise ratio. So here, you could, here we could improve, uh, make improvement, by, for example, by using a method that works with a carrier frequency. And the second point is that uh, we can use more parameters. For example, gyroscopes has much more uh, frequency modes uh, than nine. And the uh, third point is that um, improvements, improvements could also be made in the, in the error correction step, as showed by uh, the Vox, the Vox et al. This, this year at Chess. So that means it is possible that there are less bits are, are leaked in this step. So now I'm switching a little bit. So we also uh, proposed a, a specific design uh, optimized for um, optimized for uh, increasing the variability, so for deriving more bits from, from a MEM structure. And um, yeah, you can see here our proposal. So it's, uh, it consists of three masses that are coupled by, uh, uh, by springs. And we have three electrode pairs and the electrode of the, uh, of the masses. And it's very, very small from the size compared to a normal uh, MEMS gyro. 
And yeah, in, regarding the um, variability, here are, you can go two ways. So the, on the one hand, you can make measurements, uh, measures in the design part. So that is what we did here. For example, we used uh, the minimum width for, for the beams of the springs as, as it is allowed from, from the production process. And we use this doubling U springs, for example, that are very sensitive to asymmetries and that increase uh, the quadrature signals. And on the other hand, you could easily achieve uh, more variability by using a dirtier process or a worse process because the MEMS production process is uh, optimized over maybe 20 years to, to keep uh, variation at a minimum, of course. Yeah, but for our simulations, we just um, assuming the typical process variation, so we uh, consider just our measures in the design. And then we, variating, uh, we variated uh, the discussed manufacturing variations. And as you can see here, so the simulations indicate that it is possible to derive much more bits by measures in the design only on much less space. So that means also that it's conceivable for a dedicated MEMS path to combine several of such, of such structures, for example, on one chip. Yeah, so then I would like to summarize my talk. So um, we identify suitable properties of MEMS gyroscopes by measurements of 70 sensors and show that they can be used for a cryptographic key generation. Then we propose a quantization method. We verify the uniqueness and the reliability of the bit strings um, regarding uh, or considering the repeatability and temperature. And we estimated lower, uh, upper and lower bounds on the entropy of the bit strings and calculate how many responses would we need to derive this 128-bit key. And we present a new or our own MEMS design which has been optimized to increase variability, actually. Then I would like to conclude with a short outlook. So as already pointed out, those two ways are conceivable. On the one hand, uh, enhance sensors by adding uh, key storage uh, capabilities. Uh, and the other way would be to um, make a dedicated MEMS path um, where we have a lot of uh, options to increase variability. And yeah, let me just say two, uh, two uh, points of future work. Of course, there are much more than that. Um, as I already discussed, so improvements could be made in the measurement technique. And then an important point, of course, is to investigate the long-term stability of the parameters. <coughs> So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, um, please come to the microphone. You can say your name and affiliation. Uh, my name is Knut Ek. My name is Knut Ekstein, European Space Agency. I was wondering, uh, what is the economic point of introducing such an extra dirty MEMS? Uh, do you think that this would be better than other possible path candidates? So we are, we are, we are investigating that in principle. So I mean, a, a big difference between our proposal or our approach to the other paths is that we are, are using mechanical parameters. And we are hoping, so we still have to investigate this, that it, that it, is more, uh, that it can provide more temper resistant because th those uh, parameters are very sensitive to changes in its environmental, uh, in its environment. And maybe also possible um, better long-term stability because the mechanical parameters may be more stable compared to uh, other parameters like in an SRAM over the lifetime, over the usage. Of the yeah, I mean, as I said, so that's future work, so I cannot state here anything at the moment. Jung, that came from Christ. Uh, I don't know much about Puff, but uh, it is pretty well known that the MEMS gyroscope has a resonant frequency. So using sound, you can generate resonation. Uh, did you test whether, the, for example, if you find the resonant frequency, if some, some of the sound can actually bias the random number generations and those kind of things? Did you understand that? I'm not sure if I understand you correctly. The so sound can cause resonation in mm -hmm. the MEMS structure, okay? Okay, so I mean, so that would also be a problem, if, if that would be a problem, it's also a, uh, a problem for the normal operation mode for gyroscopes. Yes. So I mean, those structures are optimized, that they are um, resistant to such uh, disturbance from the environment, actually. Is, is the answer okay? So maybe you can ask again. 
Okay, all right. Uh, Matthias Hello from Fonopa Ezek. I have a question on the um, on the reuse of sensors. Um, do the sensors um, have any or store calibration information if you have variation in there and you want to use the gyroscopes to actually measure positioning or whatever? Um, do you feel there is any correlation? Or do you have to store, <coughs> store uh, data on it, um, on calibration, or are they completely uncalibrated? So, I mean, it depends uh, on the sensor. So, there are sensors where, are, where some information is stored, that's correct. But, for example, so the huge number of uh, higher frequency modes, so that are not of interest for the normal sensor mode, so there's no information about that somewhere. generating the same key under different conditions? So, I mean, that is a question of the error correction. So, I showed the intra distances. So, that describes directly the number of bit flips that you had, but it's a, it's a common problem in, in the puff area. Mm -hmm. And for that, you have an error correction, uh, the, er the, the error correction codes. So, it's state of the art to correct those bit flips. Even with that error correction, then my second question is, is it possible that the manufacturer can generate the same key for me so that the manufacturer eventually has my key? So, I mean, what is not possible to, to clone the system, so you cannot uh, manufacture the same sensors twice. So, I mean, it's a, mean, it's a, it's a basic assumption for PUFFs and it's, it's also the case. So, actually, that is what, uh, what central production would be like to do. So, they would also like to, gener uh, to manufacture the same sensor, but it's not possible. from EPFN. I have a problem with the terminology of a physically unclonable function. Uh, if it is a function which is unclonable, it means that we cannot copy it. But here, when, once we have made the measurement, we can clone it, we can copy it somewhere, right? Yeah, so the point is that you cannot physical, uh, physically clone it. So that's the point of the system. Okay. But sometimes when you have a physically unclonable function, it means a function of a large domain. So is there any hope to convert your, your solution to a function of a large domain? Could you, could you repeat your question? I'm not sure that I understand so you correctly. In s sometimes when we talk about physically enclosed function, we yeah. mean a function of a large domain. So here it's, it's a function of a small domain that you're, you presented. You, so you have a few bits to read, you read them, and once, once you have read yeah. them, you can copy them. Right? So, well, I mean, as I said, so we, our, our uh, objective is to store a secret, uh, a secret key. And it's not like for Arbiter Puffs that we have a large a uh, number of different challenge response pairs, so it's kind of an intrinsic ID. And the question, so we still have to investigate it, how temporary resistance is the, is the system? And of course it would be hard, uh, maybe infeasible, to, to get all the information to, um, to capture the key. Okay. 